Darrell Jash Johnson, Gospel Herald, CitySportsReport.com. I am here with uh, a, a man who needs no introduction and has so many different jobs <laughs> that it would take the whole interview for me to name them. But tonight, uh, Yes Network, uh, Brooklyn Nets announcer, play-by-play uh, -play man, Ian Eagle. Ian, how are you doing today? Always good to see you. Always good to be at MSG. What are, what are some of your favorite memories of, of being at Madison Square Garden? Well, for me, it grew up in Queens, Forest Hills, very tough, tough neighborhood, mean streets of Forest Hill. And I came to Knicks games as a kid. Bernard King was my guy. That was the guy that really galvanized me and my interest in basketball and later had a chance to host a show with Bernard on WFAN radio. So that was a dream come true to pick his brain on basketball. And that was a big reason why I became such a huge fan of the NBA. Obviously, it carried into my career. But my lasting memories, my first game was Knicks and 76ers and Dr. J leading the Sixers, Andrew Tony, Maurice Cheeks. So that's embedded in my brain. So what what piqued your, your interest in this industry? You know, you, you mentioned WFAN. That's when I first started listening to you. Uh, and, and, and you, you know, now you're literally everywhere. You do a lot of NFL, uh, you, you do NBA. Um, NCAA, March Madness, what, where, where did that interest for, for you begin? I had a real interest in it as a young kid, probably seven years old. The problem, when I went to my dad, I said, I want to be a sportscaster. And he said, well, that's what you'll do. So he was very encouraging. He said, one problem, though, is you're going to have to get rid of your lisp. And I said, what? The, my what? He said, you, you've got a lisp. And he was right. So he taped me, I was about seven years old, and I would listen back to the tapes and then I would record myself and it took about two to three weeks where I overcame it on my own. And then after that, it was clear sailing. But really from a very young age, I knew what I wanted to do. I was very focused on it and went to Syracuse University with the idea that this was the industry that I was gonna be a part of. That's an incredible story. Uh, from, from covering the NCAA, uh, tournament. Uh, what, what are some of your fondest memories of that? Uh, probably the best game that I had in the NCAA tournament on the television side, I did the Duke Butler championship game for the world feed. So, you know, you forget it. I, if I walk the streets of South America, there'll be a mob scene. They, I'm huge. It's a, <laughs> but that game, honestly, was one of the most thrilling sporting events I've ever witnessed, and they came within that half-court heave of pulling off maybe the biggest upset in sports history. Uh, for CBS, had a Wake Forest, West Virginia double overtime game, which comes to mind, Chris Paul's last collegiate game at Wake Forest, West Virginia behind Mike Ganzi and Kevin Pitznagel won the game in double overtime to advance to the Sweet 16. That was probably the most competitive game that I remember. Jim Spinarkle, who I work with on Nets games, he and I did that game in Cleveland. High level of play, a lot of drama, a lot of intrigue, and uh, for Chris Paul, unfortunately, a bittersweet memory. Final, final question. Uh, I know you, you do some stuff with Bruce Beck over the summer. Uh, for, for young kids who are who were you when you were their age? Uh, let, let the people know what, what you do. Yeah, we do a broadcasting camp. We've done it for 13 years. It's for kids between the ages of 13 and 17. And it's been an amazing success. And it's very gratifying to see a lot of these young people move on and become something in this industry. And they've used it as a starting point a place to get some basic knowledge, rudimentary knowledge. Bruce, who you know, is one of the most passionate guys that you'll ever find. He's passionate about the work, and he's a great person to boot. We have a good combination. Our, uh, I think our whole approaches complement one another, and it's really turned into a, a great experience. It's very taxing. I respect teachers and for everything that they do, and I get it. I fully understand. To engage young people and to keep them interested it's been very rewarding, though. Final question, real quick on, on the teams that are actually played. Let's actually talk about the NBA. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the Brooklyn Nets, the, the New York Knicks, both off to what, what we would consider slow starts. What do you think each team needs to do to turn things around for the season? I think the Nets really have to identify what their personality is and what their identity is. I believe 
they're going to get back to where they were two years ago in allowing Brooke Lopez to take jump shots, uh, Darren Williams, Joe Johnson, to get back to their style of play. Uh, look, Lionel Hollins is a proud guy. He's got a very specific coaching philosophy, but he's also a smart guy. And I think he'll make some adjustments now after the first 16, 17 games, getting a feel for his team. Uh, you're going to see some improvement from them. For the Knicks, look, the triangle offense, this is not something where you snap your fingers and it works. So this adjustment period is still taking place. Carmelo's is a, he's as gifted a scorer as there is in the NBA. He needs help, though. They're, these complimentary guys have to step forward. All right. Thanks for your time, Ian. Always a pleasure. You got it, bud.